Today, we have two presenters joining us, Nelson Arake and Paul H. Van Stratton. The format for these presentations today and the Q&A will be that both Nelson and Paul will be presenting back to back, and then we will open up for Q&A, at which time I'll also invite Nelson and Paul into a conversation with one another about their work. We will take short breaks between the presentations and also before the Q&A to help us gather our thoughts to engage in Convo and then also to move around a little bit. Before we begin, I wanna introduce you to our two presenters. First, we have Nelson Arake, who was born in Bogota, Colombia, and he lives in Dania Beach, Florida with his wife and daughter. Nelson teaches theology at Cardinal Gibbons High School in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And he is also an adjunct instructor at St. Thomas University in Miami, Florida, where he teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on Latinx theology. Nelson's research interests in environmental theology and Hispanic Latinx theology and ministry are reflected in his book, Seven Steps of Reflection and Guide for Parish Dialogue in Light of Laudato Si. Continuing the process of the V in Crento and the forthcoming in 2026, living in our common home, Latinx theological cosmology. As part of his academic training, Nelson has a Bachelor in Arts in Philosophy and Letters from the University of La Salle in Bogota, Colombia. His master's degree in pastoral ministry from St. Thomas University in Miami, Florida, and a doctorate in ministry from Barry University in Miami, Florida. Mr. Paul H. Van Stratton, is a Master of Education and Post-Secondary Education student at the Memorial University of Newfoundland. He has previously earned a Master of Theological Studies from Queen's University and a Bachelor of Arts in Religious Studies from the University of Waterloo. Paul's research interests include adult Christian education, Christian history, game-based learning, artificial intelligence, ritual, and disability. During Paul's previous degree, he wrote on the topic of nature-based spirituality, associated with 17th century Christian history. Paul plans to write a future master's thesis on a topic related to intellectual disability and Christian faith formation. If you could just show some snaps or claps or hands for our two speakers as they begin. We're gonna begin with Dr. Nelson Arake's presentation. And at some point we'll do some screen sharing, so just be aware of that as well. Welcome Nelson. Now, good morning to all. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's my first time in uh, in the Religious Education Association. Um, I see that um, Israel is there. I know Israel for many years. Thank you for being there, Israel. And um, so let, let me start with this. Um, what, what is the title of my presentation? How does the Asekia honor and celebrate Earth? So we need to understand first what is Asekia and the theological, or my, my theological perspective on the Asekia, okay? So let me start first with um, some kind of theology as a background, which I will explain what is the, theolo the theology, uh, theological cosmology, specifically from Alejandro Garcia Rivera, which was, uh, who was a um, Latino theologian who taught at Berkeley and passed away, uh, I think at least uh, more than 10 years ago. So for, so, what is a theological cosmology from, or from the perspective of Alejandro Garcia Rivera? Very shortly, I would say is an aesthetics of creation. So in other words, is an attempt to see the inner meaning of all things. Okay, very basic there. Now, now when he's writing his last book and um, a actually, a theological cosmology, the Guardian of God, a theological cosmo cosmology. He he asks a question: Are we at home in the cosmos? So pay attention to the word home and pay attention to the word cosmos. Are we at home in the cosmos? Why? Because because the, because we need to talk about or we need to realize and understand uh, our relationship to our responsibilities to our shaping of the relationship between us and the cosmos and the creation and the nature. 
And that will give us a very good understanding of who are we as humans in this cosmos. So when he was trying to answer that question, he went to the first account of the creation and the second account of the creation in the Bible. From the, second, for the first account of the creation, he realized that it's about dominion and subduing. And the second account of the creation, he realized is about the human, the human beings are in tragedy. So they must struggle to survive in the cosmos. So I mean, it was like a mix between glory and struggle. Okay, this is what what we get from the from the uh, what what Garcia Rivera uh, get from the biblical accounts. So as we live, as we understand this theological cosmology, we are living also in a mix between glory and struggle. Okay. And actually, this understanding, glory and struggle, is a mystery. And, and it, as we understand this mystery or answer this mystery, or the mystery will reveal to us, we will realize how to live in harmony with the cosmos. Where important issues here, for example, sacrifice, for example, humility, for example, respect, for example, openness to receive what is the creation as a gift. That is important for, for Garcia Rivera. So this is how, from the Latin understanding, we realize, hey, what is in front of us? We need to, we need to be in a relationship, but also it, that relationship implies from us, again, humility, respect, sacrifice, and um, openness. Also gratitude. Also gratitude. Now, maybe in this short presentation until until now this your presentation you realize that but there's someone else said that before oh yeah Tirar de Chardin said that before some because because Garcia Rivera are um, review Tirar de Chardin theology and he and in his review he realized mm, probably um Tirar de Chardin was lacking because of the time probably some kind of better understanding or better theology of the Holy Spirit and why the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit, as Garcia Rivera will, will say, is, is the one who made the humans understand the cosmos as an order unity in the realm of beauty through the Holy Spirit. So what Garcia Rivera was saying, is saying, beauty is the most visible sign of the Holy Spirit. So this is what probably is the, the, um, the contribution from Garcia Rivera to the theology of Tierra de Chardin. Now, in all of these things, like uh, what about the Latinx? Okay, so we have a Latino theologian, okay, but how the Latinx apply that? So if we see in the Latinx experience of creation, in the Latinx experience in the United States, you know, in every single understanding, it's about sacrifice, it's about humility, it's about respect, it's about openness and gratitude. And, and, and Latinx, I am talking about Latinx here, not like a, as we are, I am a Latino too, um, no, like we know these things better than any other culture, no. But my focus is Latino theology, uh, Latinx theology. And Latinx also express the relationship with creation in that way. So we see or we realize that earth, that nature, that creation is a gift. So this is, this is, and, and where I see this, where, where a specific setting I see this, in something that is called the acequia. The acequia, as, will, as I will explain, uh, reflect the respect and the sacrifice of every single creature in the community, including the plants, the animals, because they must have a rightful share of water. Water is especially important in the states like uh, northern New Mexico and southern Colorado, which is where the acequias actually are very, um, um, we see the practice of the acequia there. So let me, let me say what is the acequia. Basically, acequia is a water conduit for irrigation. It's a ditch that the farmers uses in order to get the water into the plantation. And you may say, but oh, this is so simple. 
is indeed simple. Yeah, it's very simple. So, but what is around the acequia is respect, is humility, is sacrifice, and is understanding that everything belongs to everybody. Okay, now, and this is when the theology and the Latinx understanding of creation and the cosmology and the theological cosmology make sense. Now, where is this Asekia? Well, like uh, the story of the Asekia. Um, actually, it is from it is from um 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 again, um Michael Mayer, an emeritus professor of history at the University of Arizona, described the Anasazi, a group, an indigenous group, especially around Arizona and all of these places close by, and they actually create or realize the importance of the acequia. Okay, so this is, at the, again, a ditch on the soil that will conduct the water from the, from the river to the plantation. And um, among the successors of the Anasazi, we have the Pueblos uh, in New Mexico, who also realize the importance and conduct the water to the plantation in that way. And the Pueblos are those who met the Spaniards. And when the Spaniards came here and realized that this is like a infrastructure, Okay, this this specific infrastructure, like how they how they conduct the water in this way, they realize this is an important issue. And actually, they have in Spain they have something similar from uh, actually from the from the Arabs. Okay, something so it's like like uh, they the Anasazi the Anasazi were doing here, the pueblos were doing here, but also uh, the the um, the Asekia, has an origin in the Arabs, in the Romans also, the Spaniards, and all of this is an, an intermingling of cultures that we see in this practice. And um, well, one of the Spaniards, actually the first Spaniard who said in New Mexico, when he saw the irrigation, the irrigation canals of the pueblos in 1591, he says, incredible to anyone who had not seen with his own eyes. So it's an actual and engineering thing. So how they realize to put the water into the plantations. Okay, the other thing I would like to say is like um, years later, for example, um, um, another expert, uh, the, the, his last name is Roy Val, summarized the Arabic, the Roman and the Spanish roots of the Asequias in their later development, thanks to the Southwest Native American agricultural regulation practices. So again, what we see in the Sequia is an intermingler of cultures until now. Then the so years pass and the Southwest pass from the Spaniards to the United States and all of these things and a lot of laws and things there. And um and the Asequias has been significant in the development and the economic survival of the communities of the Southwest. They have provided water, an element of sheer necessity for the villages. As year pass, the community around the Asequias developed their own rules from customs, traditions, and local practices. Eventually, they evolved and organized themselves into self-government corporate body with shared under uh, responsibilities for the welfare of the community. So we see that these irrigation, canals of irrigation, now they are organizing among the people. And now we see that the people are taking part of this. And this is evolving as a self-government body. So that that need, need some people to like managers or commissioners, and this is what is the, the other part of the acequia. Um, to, let me, to, 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 um, so what is the structure of the of the acequia? The structure of the acequia is based on um, a majordomo, which is the manager, 
and the majordomo uh, is assisted by some commissioners. And the commissioners are also elected from the people who will enjoy the acequia. And all of all of the, the rest of the people are called parciantes. And the parciantes are those who are who, who enjoy the, the acequia and benefit from the water. But the whole point here is like um, the acequia practice as a cooperative and sus subsistent work also implies an annual meeting, meeting to elect the majordomo and commissioners and to deal with other ditch businesses such as crisis management during drought and to decide how the water will be divided into the common streams on their pending conditions. So depend on the situation of the, of, of the, of the water. Sometimes some parciante need more water than others. So we need to start a negotiation. But the whole point here is that it's about gratitude, it's about sacrifice, it's about community, it's about being there for the others. And how is this possible? Through the water because the water is essential. And the water is transported through this ditch that is called acequia in order to distribute the water to all who need it. Now, um, what are the, what is the intersection between the theological cosmology and the acequia? Now, so we have some characteristics. For example, one is moral economy. A moral economy of water is an ethic based on a well-defined set of practices, rules, norms, and correspond to material relationship relations with a vital resource such as water. So we have the water and we need to distribute the water. So in equal parts, or sometimes not so equal, this is where we have the sacrifice. And because some persons or some patients need more water. So we need to take, we need to take turns to receive the water and this is this is where the community start to live in for the others. Um, the other uh, the other category is mutualism. Mutualism refers to the social capital of a community that foster a relationship of interdependence based on mutual trust and re reciprocity for the common good. What is the common good here? The water, and everybody needs the water because precisely in this region. Uh, Colorado um, is the the water is scarcity it's a scarcity of water, okay. So we, they need the water in order to provide in order for the economy in order to provide for the families. Um, also, there is something about respect, and actually there are there is the the respect understood as honor and virtue. It refers to the personal comportment and differentiates individual horizontally with a moral community. So horizontally means that we are equal. We are equal. We look for the unity, we look for the community, we look for the quality, because at the end, all of us need water. And the water is the one that will provide for us what we need. Um, also, also here, it's something about like a, how Latinx understand like the respect, but from vergüenza. Vergüenza is shame. And shame is like, a, if I don't do the right thing, I should be ashamed of myself because I am not respecting others as I supposed to be respected, as I supposed to be, as I suppo as I supposed to be respected, yes. So all of these, the acequia, this, each, Ditch, water ditch is an important institution that grows from the uh, Anasazi indigenous people to become actually a self-government body in the state of, for example, Colorado. And they have acequias all around the Colorado. And they understand that if they don't go and respect don't go to the acequia and don't respect what is to be an acequia, nobody will get water and everybody is depending on water. So I hope you understand, I hope you understand the, this, this 
idea of the acequia, this idea of respect and gratitude and how we as humans, we need the natural resources. And the acequia celebrates earth because earth, earth and creation because water is a God's creation. Um, thank you very much. And um, Christine, I go back to you. Thank you, Nelson. Um, I can't wait to hear the resonances between your work and also Paul's work. I think this is gonna be a really amazing discussion. I wanna invite you just to stretch for, let's say, um, I'm going for about 25 minutes. Let's stretch for about five minutes. You can hang out here with me if you like, but just move your body around, get some water, do what you need to do. And I also invite you to write down any reflections you have based on Nelson's presentation. Um, and any questions that you might want to put in the chat, I will keep track of those. So you don't have to wait to post those. I can go ahead and keep track of them now. So we'll see you back here in, at, let's see, 1027 Eastern. Nelson, how are you doing, sir? Hola, que me cuenta. How are you, man? <laughs> I'm doing all right, man. I'm doing all so right. I, I, well, actually, actually I, was, I was writing your message. <laughs> <laughs> how you doing, so Christine? Ha, ha, okay. Doing well. Ha, Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, oof. I was so nervous. I tell you. I'm sure, I'm sure. It's, it's you know, you're presenting, one thing is you're presenting, and then you're presenting through this Zoom thing that it in itself creates a sense of distance, and there's, there's something uh, to people being in front of you to help get a vibe. Yeah, yeah, it helps. You know? No, <laughs> it helps to see to see the people and to catch the energy of the people. <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's see what are the questions. Let's see. Let's see, hopefully, hopefully it was good. So what about you, man? How is Emory? Good, good, good. Getting ready for a course now uh, for faculty mm -hmm. <clears throat> on engaging pedagogies and uh, using backward design and equitable pedagogies to do in-person and online learning. Good, good. So, good. yeah, I was in Miami a week last week visiting family. Mm -hmm. Oh. It was hot and humid, friend. Oh. No, no, no. I, I am, I am in, I am in Colombia right now with my sister. Oh yeah. In my sister's house, but when we so like um, we came, we we came here on Friday, and on Friday was ninety five, ninety six. Oh, mm. That was horrible. That was, oh, that was so humid. Oh. Oh. And now we are here like a uh, thirteen or something, thirteen, so not. Uh, no fun here, but Celsius, 13, 15, it's really cold. Where in Colombia are you right now? Bogota. Bogota. Mm. Yeah, we were in Barranquilla last, in the NMA visiting family. Oh, you are Barranquilla, so, bonito, bonito. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. And Christine, how's your summer? So busy and so short. <laughs> so short. <laughs> It feels short. Um, our summers here are pretty much governed by uh, by the kids' time out of school and the school district they're in. They they go back to school July thirtieth. Oh so, no! Yeah. Oh wow! What is that? Yeah. No, in the middle of, in the middle of summer. 
I know it's it is um yeah I what school district is that the city of Decatur Oh, Ooh. so you haven't been in the city of Decatur. They have that schedule. Yeah, yeah. So they're um, they're off end of May to the end of July. So um, technically, they have two months. months. Yeah. Two months. It goes too fast. And I honestly, but, I mean, we all know developmentally, I feel like kids need more time away, you know, mm -hmm. like longer chunks to like stretch and grow in different ways. And the way they try to make up for it is, that extra month they would normally get in August is spread out through the year. So they have a week long break every six weeks. Oh, that's, oh. that makes sense. That, that, that makes yeah. sense. looks good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and the teachers need it too. <laughs> teachers need it too. It is hard on, on working families, like yeah. Uh, yeah. parents and caregivers that are working to have to take a week off, like every six weeks or try to find scramble to find care is really how it's going. Oh. So, ah, how are you? Nice You're doing okay. It's... You're getting ready. Me? Yeah. I'm, uh, we were, uh, well, this is my first year back in Atlanta after it's coming here to yeah. study. And so it's been adjusting. We moved last year. We were able to purchase a home in the spring. So getting things organized. Um, and then we had my mother-in-law visiting from Colombia uh, mm. over in June. And um, so it's been hectic. So I'm hoping the next three weeks I can finalize things in the house so that when this fall starts, I can just, okay, now what do I want to do to enjoy as opposed to what do we do <laughs> to organize and, you know, get settled or feel settled. Yeah, well, uh, best of luck to you as you do that. That's, that is, yes. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to Models in Context. We are ready to move on to our second presenter, Paul. And Paul's going to be sharing screen with us. So we will see that. And then after that, we'll take another quick break and then engage in conversation together. Welcome, Paul. Paul, your mic is muted. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just uh, getting this uh, set up here. Okay, here we go. Okay. Sorry, I'm just going to do this here. Okay. Okay, can everyone, can you, uh, okay, sounds good. So, <clears throat> hello, I am presenting my paper, anticipating the opportunities and challenges of using commercial off-the-shelf games to educate people on environmental sustainability in a Christian context. Before I start, there are a few matters that I need to discuss. First, this presentation does not include many pictures. However, I have attempted to write alternative descriptions for any pictures found in the slideshow for people who are visually impaired. Second, I want to acknowledge the traditional caretakers of the lands that I have occupied as a person of European settler descent. In particular, I acknowledge the Anishabak, Haudenosaunee, Adawandrin, Huron Wendat, and Lenape Indigenous peoples. I seek to learn and deepen my appreciation for Indigenous spiritualities and customs as I work toward reconciliation within my religious community. Third, I want to point out that most of the gameplay images shown in this presentation were taken from YouTube gameplay videos. I tried recording my own gameplay images while playing the games involved in this study. However, my capture card had a serious malfunction that damaged my computer, and so I was unable to take my own gameplay footage. The goal of my paper was to explore whether game-based learning could be a viable pedagogical method to educate Christians on environmental matters in church small group settings. My qualitative research suggests that this idea has some merit. I will begin by briefly outlining what this presentation will entail. During my presentation, I will briefly discuss my personal social location, theoretical background, methodology and game study, findings and conclusions. It is important to understand my social location as my paper embraces my biases to anticipate challenges and opportunities of utilizing game-based learning in Christian culture. I am a white, male, cisgender, Christian settler. I have privileges and opportunities that are built on a history that includes colonialism and the oppression of members of other spiritualities. My perspectives are shaped as an autistic person who is mentally disabled with obsessive compulsive disorder. 
Finally, and perhaps most significantly, I am rooted in the Christian evangelical uh, tradition, and this religious perspective shape this religious perspective affects how I view challenges in congregational settings. I will briefly go over the theoretical background of my paper. The core topics here are ecological literacy, ecological illiteracy among Christians, game-based learning, and gaming culture in evangelicals. A core concept in my paper is the topic of ecological literacy. Ecological literacy is defined by David Orr as the comprehension of the interrelatedness of life grounded in the study of natural history, ecology, and thermodynamics. It is notable that many traditional indigenous ways of knowing are aligned with, with ecological lit literacy. Ecological literacy is needed to understand a variety of ecological crises. If we are ecologically literate, we are better equipped to understand how climate change and environmental degradation is a social justice issue that disproportionately affects people who are poor, racialized, or indigenous. Finally, it is important to recognize that, while there are notable exceptions, dominant Christian discourses have not emphasized ecological literacy. Indeed, ecological illiteracy is a problem in the Christian community. Traditionally, the church has endorsed anthropocentrism and dominion-centered views. Furthermore, citing scripture against so-called nature cults, Christians have dismantled eco-aware indigenous spiritualities. A famous example of this in my country of Canada is the use of church-run residential schools to impose colonial views on indigenous groups. Quantitative research shows that Christians continue to avoid prioritizing environmental issues. And as many of you are aware, a lack of global economic a, global of, a lack of global environmental concern is particularly prominent in the evangelical Christian community. Quantitative and qualitative research consistently finds that evangelical Christians often deny the existence of climate change. Robin Beldman, an ethnographer, suggested that this denial may derive from a lack of ecological literacy among evangelical Christians. She suggested that ecological literacy is challenging to develop because observing environmental changes is hindered by the slow passage of time. If Feldman is correct, a possible solution to Christian ecological liter illiteracy is to simulate ec ecological change in a shortened time span. This may be achievable by utilizing game-based learning. Game-based learning is the pedagogical use of games. Game-based learning is a huge field and it is impossible to do justice to the topic within a single slide. This study focuses on the use of commercial off-the-shelf games. Commercial off-the-shelf games are primarily designed for entertainment. However, since commercial off-the-shelf games tend to model or simulate reality on some level, they can be used to provide preparation for future learning via experiential learning. A prominent theory in game-based learning is Jane Gee's situated learning matrix. In a nutshell, the situated learning matrix illustrates how games create meaningful learning experiences by requiring players to solve problems with tools and technologies that are appropriate to an in-game identity. The situated learning matrix can be illustrated with one of the games that this study examined titled Endling Extinction is Forever. In Endling, players are faced with the problem of securing enough food for the survival of a mother fox's pups. Players are given tools that are appropriate for a fox, such as the ability to smell, run, or pounce. As players use these tools in the simulated problem space, they learn about what it is like to live as a predator in a complex ecosystem. The image on the right shows gameplay of a fox pouncing on prey located in a pile of snow in a snow-covered forest. Note that in the above example, the players have not learned any religious content. Most commercial off-the-shelf games do not contain explicit religious content. What is provided to players is a concrete experience of an ecosystem. The religious educator must consider whether it is possible to link this concrete experience to religious content in a way that enables a deeper understanding of both ecology and theology. Another consideration of game-based learning is the relationship between gameplay, player memory, and player learning. 
For now, it is sufficient to understand that this study selected strategy games, as these games require players to use analytical thinking skills. Game-based learning is a growing concept in Christian contexts. The strategy has been used in Christian formal graduate education. However, I have not found studies that discuss the use of game-based learning in lay Christian contexts. Game-based learning may be effective amongst evangelical, evangelical Christian laity. The reason for this is that many evangelical Christians play video games, often in ways that blur the distinction between game and reality. These research findings do not surprise me. I am an evangelical gamer myself. Many games I play were introduced to me by fellow evangelical gamers. My formal introduction to board gaming culture was through evangelicals who played modern board games in youth groups. Also, many evangelical churches I attend have board game nights in which the community is invited to play board games. Having said this, commercial off-the-shelf games do not tend to be designed for use in a worship environment. As such, there is a need to explore whether commercial off-the-shelf games are suitable for introducing to a church learning environment. Now that I've highlighted some of my theoretical background, I would like to discuss my paper's methodology and the games I study to collect data. My study utilized a theoretically driven content analysis approach. I viewed each game through a conceptual lens constructed from game-based learning theory and environmental sustainability theory. Additionally, I utilized a hermeneutical lens constructed from my prior learning in theological studies. My method of data collection involved participatory observation. Normally, when this term is used, it refers to a process of making observations of individuals in a group setting by participating in a group activity. However, in the context of this study, it refers to observations I made while interacting with digital games and board games. I played four ecological games, two digital games, and two board games. The data I collected was on experiences I encountered while playing games, such as my emotions in response to gameplay, or moments of gameplay that stood out for me. Following my data collection, I drew on my theological background to code my notes in the themes. The first game I played was Endling Extinction is Forever. In this digital game of the survival genre, players take on the identity of the last mother fox on Earth, who must take care of her pups. The game dis depicts a dystopian future in which Earth has been heavily impacted by pollution. The picture on the right displays the promotional art of Endling Extinction is Forever. The picture displays the text, Endling Extinction is Forever. A family of four foxes can be seen crossing a log over a body of water that is heavily polluted. The scene takes place at night with the moon in the background. The crossing is in a forested region. However, humans can be seen in the background and there is a factory in the background. The second game I played was The Wandering Village. In this digital game of a survival genre, players must participate in a symbiotic relationship with a large island-like creature. The creature moves around the world into various biomes that have differing climates. This movement simulates rapid climate change. The picture shows cover art for The Wandering Village. It contains the words, The Wandering Village. A large creature that looks part island, part dinosaur, is prominently standing in the image. A small village can be seen on the creature's back with an airship over the village. The third game I played was Spear Island. In this cooperative board game of a survival genre, various spirits that embody natural features of the land are threatened by the invasion of colonial settlers. The goal of the game is to scare the settlers from the island. This picture shows the cover of the board game of, board game of Spirit Island. It contains the words Spirit Island, a game by Eric Rouse, and the Cooperative Settler Destruction Strategy Game. The box depicts an island surrounded by water with various spirits over it and early modern ships heading to the island. Finally, the fourth game I played was Catan Scenarios Oil Springs, an expansion for the settlers of Catan, which is a cooperative civilization or economic game. In the Oil Springs expansion, oil is introduced as a natural resource on the Catan Island. The oil increases production at the expense of natural disasters triggered by climate change. Pictured is a package of um, pictured is a package containing Catan scenario oil springs. 
The package contains a brown punch out board with a large instruction manual over top. The instruction manual contains a great deal of text, an image on the Catan Island player board, and various tiles used in the oil spring scenario. Next, I want to discuss the findings of my study. For the sake of brevity, I will focus my findings on Endling. However, I encourage you to read my paper to learn about my findings from the other games. In particular, I will discuss themes associated with anticipated opportunities and challenges for game-based learning in Christian small groups that I encountered while playing the games. Additionally, I will discuss general observations I made while playing the games. As a warning, if you want to avoid having the plot of Endling spoiled, you may want to step away from my presentation for the next few minutes. Also, as a trigger warning, some of the slides contain depictions of violence against animals. The first opportunity theme that emerged in my study is encountering desperation. I encountered desperation while looking for food for my hungry pups. Locating food meant searching for food among competing predators and unpredictable humans. Often these encounters with competing predators and humans gave me feelings of anxiety. Pictured to the right is an image of the mother fox in competition with a badger. Unfortunately, despite my best efforts, I watched as one of my pups slowly lost energy until it starved to death. At one point in the game, I found an area with a lush forest and a great deal of food. Pictured is a fox finding food from a bush in a large forest, in a lush forest. As I explored the forest, I noticed humans moving into forested areas to cut down trees. Pictured is a fox on a forest path. In the background on the right are a number of trees. The, ba the background on the left depicts logging equipment, such as a machine with a claw. A number of stumps and logs are also present in the background. Soon, the territory that provided a great deal of nutritious food was reduced to a wasteland. Pictured is a fox transversing a log in a region in which many trees have been cut down. My pups were starving, so I moved into a human settled area and eventually killed a domestic chicken. Pictured is a slaughterhouse shaped like a farm. Chickens hang upside down on a conveyor belt. A chicken is on the ground to the left. The chicken on the ground is highlighted in green because it is being smelled by, the, by a fox. The fox is pictured hunting the chicken. When I reflected on this experience, I began to empathize with the coyotes that are, that are caught and killed in my local region to prevent them from killing pets. On a practical level, the game provided a concrete experience of the desperation that is experienced by wildlife. If this concrete experience can awaken empathy for wildlife, learners can be encouraged to reflect and dialogue on Christian verses about loving others. The second opportunity theme that emerged in my study is the value of elevating human life above nature. One feature of Endling is that the game reminds players of the finality of extinction every time the player dies. Pictured is one of the game over screens of Endling. It shows a dead fox pup next to a walking fox. The screen is black with white and black words that say, game over, you died, your cubs won't survive. Now I consider myself to be a rather competent to be rather competent at digital games, but I died many times while playing Endling, usually at the hands of hunters. Pictured is the second game over screen of Endling. It is black with white words reading Endling, extinction is forever. Press A to continue. In the, in the final third of the game's plot, the player learns that one of the hunters is hunting the mother fox to earn a monetary reward that can save the hunter's sick daughter. This picture shows the hunter's daughter beside a fox family uh, behind a wood ca cabin in a forest. The wood cabin has drawings depicting a human family on it. The young girl is giving food to the fox family. This picture shows the hunter's daughter later in the game in a garbage dump. The girl is giving food to the fox family. The girl has visible markings of poverty and sickness. This realization was quite uncomfortable for me. When the, and when the daughter finally died, I found myself caught between my anthropocentric leanings and the harsh lesson that the, both the fox and the hunter fight for survival in a game of unequal consequences. The picture shows a bearded hunter kneeling beside his dead daughter who lies on the ground. 
the fox family stands near the hunter as the hunter opens a cage holding a fox pup. In my paper, I wrote openly about my thought process as I reflected on the matter. Witnessing the juxtaposition between the mother fox and the hunter father was possibly the first time that I seriously questioned the wisdom of Christian anthropocentrism. So on a practical level, I think that games like Endling have the potential to question the value of anthropocentrism. This opens the opportunity for religious educators to discuss indigenous spiritualities in pursuit of reconciliation between indigenous peoples and the church. Similarly, exposing Christian e evangelicals to a non-anthropocentric experience opens the possibility of reflecting on non-anthropocentric biblical texts, such as Job 38 to 39, that expose human foolishness in relying on human reasoning in natural matters. The third opportunity theme that emerged in my study is the impact of letting history run its course. Enling's plot illustrates various impacts of human development, such as unregulated animal protection, garbage, and deforestation. The picture to the right shows a mother fox with a plastic bag on her head. The fox stands in a dump surrounded by garbage. A factory is shown in the background. By supplementing Enling's plot with biblical wisdom literature on the consequences of sin, it may be possible to facilitate dialogue in small groups on the short-term and long-term impact of social choices. The first challenge theme that emerged in my study is disorienting symbols. In Endling, hunters are portrayed as killers and murderers. This could offend Christians who believe that hunting is justifiable. In this picture, a mother fox is shown creeping along the ground behind bushes. Behind the bushes is a large person holding a hunting rifle. Light is used in the picture to show that the hunter is looking in the direction of the fox. In this picture, a mother fox is shown running in a forest. A skinny person holding an ax in the air above the person's head is shown chasing the fox. Likewise, other games contain religious imagery or political ideas that may be controversial in a Christian context. For example, I worry that some evangelical Christians may find the idea of playing the role of a spirit to be blasphemous. Likewise, as a settler, I worry about utilizing totem images when Christians have historically torn down these symbols of indigenous spirituality. Another problem is that Oil Springs gameplay does not illustrate cause and effect with regards to climate change, natural disasters, and it is possible that evangelical Christians may find this gameplay to be overly political. This photo of a mock Spirit Island game shows the Spirit Island game board. The game board has a number of colorful sections showing different types of terrain. On various sections are little huts, little white people, discs representing spirit presence, and stacked discs representing spirit totems. In front of the board is a player board showing player actions and the image of a Thunderbird spirit. Yet, there is a silver lining to this challenge. Specifically, the disorienting symbols may present opportunities for ecological discussion. For example, acquiring empathy for a spirit in Spirit Island may open opportunities to discuss the importance of having cultural humility for Indigenous groups. Likewise, it, is, it may be possible to put a creative spin on this challenge theme. Perhaps playing as a fox allows one to view the world from a different species location. Maybe we can imagine that hunters are terrifying to foxes, or perhaps people can be encouraged to develop habitat humility when interacting with ecosystems that are foreign to them. In my paper, I considered the possibility of a small group leaders asking people to read 1 Corinthians uh, 9 verses uh, 9 to 10 from the perspective of a nearly extinct species. The passage reads, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is threading out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Or does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was indeed written for our sake. For whoever plows shall plow in hope, and whoever threshes should thresh in hope of a share in the crop. The final challenge theme that emerged in my study is that, of in, that environmental degradation is tolerable. 
As I noted in my paper, this team has been identified by other scholars who have examined ecological games. This was the only team that was not prominent in Endling, as the ending of Endling is quite tragic. Other games involved in this study showcase how, it, how at least some humans can survive environmental degradation. For instance, it is possible to win a game of Catan while exploiting oil to the detriment of other players. On a practical level, the existence of this team illustrates how environmental degradation poses unequal effects for different populations. Tackling this challenge may require religious educators to supplement small groups with extra learning materials to cultivate empathy for non-local groups. I also made some general observations that did not fit into themes, but could be useful to religious leaders who might want to try utilizing commercial off-the-shelf games in Christian small group settings. The first observation is that not all structures are equally compatible with every small group study structure. In small groups that I tend to lead, I would lean toward using Endling as it contains chapters that can be divided among several weeks. However, the Wandering Village may be, suit, may be better suited for, to a one-day workshop, since it is difficult to divide the gameplay of the Wandering Village into segments. Another observation is that small group leaders should expect participants to encounter accessibility issues. Some games may be too challenging for some players. Likewise, some games have challenging user interfaces. Finally, some games may be compatible with Christian spirituality involving the natural world. For example, the natural settings of Endling may be drawn upon in meditation of the goodness of God's creation. Having discussed the study's findings, I will briefly discuss the study's conclusions on whether ecological game-based learning could be viable in Christian small group settings. Do the games have the potential to convince Christians that environmental degradation is real and relevant? Sadly, none of the games in this study presented a causal argument for climate change. As such, I do not believe that these games could convince a skeptical Christian that climate change is real. Having said this, apathetic Christians who, exper who experience emotional impact from the games may be motivated to learn more about environmental sustainability. Another important question is whether these games belong in a worship environment. First, I want to acknowledge that game-based learning is not for every church community and that it is important to consider one's context before attempting a learning intervention. Furthermore, small group leaders who attempt to integrate games such as Spirit Island may need to consider cultural sensitivity. Yet, there is some possibility that ecological game-based learning may help Christians relate to others, both human and non-human. Furthermore, since some ecological games may simulate the beauty and fragility of God's creation, it may be possible to integrate nature-based Christian spirituality into small group studies that utilize such games. While this paper anticipates that ecological commercial off-the-shelf games may be a viable method for teaching Christians about environmental sustainability in a small group context, more research is needed to determine if this teaching method will work in practice. There is a need for researchers to conduct small groups with commercial off-the-shelf games and make qualitative and quantitative observations on how people respond to this type of instruction. And so these are just my references for the images that were used in the presentation and my references for the games that I studied and uh, select, selected re references so you can see more references if you check out my paper. And thank you, that's, that's everything. Thank you, Paul. We just show some appreciation if you're on the screen or in the chat for Paul's exciting presentation. Thank you. I wanna invite us to take another five minute break. Um, and during this time, stretch, hydrate, whatever you need to do, but also um, let that marinate with you, the last two presentations. And if you start to have questions or things that you'd like um, to discuss with the presenters today, go ahead and place those in the chat where you're gonna be welcome when you come back to raise your hand and speak that on camera. All right, we'll see you back here at 11 o'clock in five minutes, Eastern Standard.
Yeah, Christine, I've taken to saying times in reference to the hour. So like at the top of the hour or 10 minutes past the hour or so, because um, yeah, people are all over. Nelson and Paul, when we come back, um, I'm also going to invite you to engage one another in conversation based on what you heard. There's a lot of um, great points of connection between your presentation, so I hope we can dig into that. Welcome back, everyone, to the Q&A portion of this session. I'm going to open up the chat and go ahead and invite everyone with a question or a comment to go ahead and engage there. Or if you prefer to 
speak into the space with your camera on or off. Um, or you can raise your hand if your camera is on so I can see that as well. And I'll go ahead and moderate the session. I also want to invite our presenters, Nelson and Paul, to speak with one another about some of the overlaps or questions that they have for one another and comments that they have for one another based on what they've heard today. So the floor is open. There aren't any questions yet in the chat. I'll give you all a few minutes to get that in there. Is there someone that would like to make a comment? Uh, I can't I, see I, uh, everyone. Okay, I, Paul, great. Yeah, I, I have a question for, for, for Nelson. I really enjoyed uh, listening to your presentation, Nelson. It, uh, it was great to hear about your, uh, your, your, um, your theological cosmology and how it relates to the Askia. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, so I noticed that my research prepares people for action, whereas your research describes a model in which people uh, are already prepared for action. And I think you have creatively illustrated cosmology and interdependence through the Askia ritual maintenance. How did you do, how did you identify the Askia as being representative of theological cosmology? And how may religious educators who do not have access to Askia, such as just as myself, I don't live in an area that has has anything like Askia, uh, how how could we discover similar ecological activities that may have a, a cosmological significance? You are muted. Yeah, thank yeah. This is a big question, Paul. But thank you very much. Um, okay, so myself, I I have never seen an asekia, never in my life. I just I just got the topic by researching about that, and what called my attention is the intermingling of the cultures in this in this practice. Also, um, what called my attention was like a like a is. Is something very Latinx, and my 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 um, my research is on Latinx theology. So, what what is the what is the theology? The, what is or what is the interaction between the, Lat the the Latinx theology and the theological cosmology? The theological cosmology is about to see, is is an attempt to see the the inner things. What what is the goodness there? And in this let me call that simple practice called asekia, which is actually is, is the the parsiantes do go to go with with tools and and on the on the earth on the soil and make the ditch in order for the water to be conducted there so you may say but where is where what theology is there the theology is to realize that earth and the natural resources are a gift, and they are for all of us. It's about community, okay? And if I have the, the natural resources just for me, it's about self-center, it's about egocentrism, it's about uh, greed. All of these issues, okay, I can, uh, are reflected in the theology. Now, um, the, um, the, this, this, um, this what, what I say, this, uh, let me see one second. This year, um, the, the Religious Education Association asks us to uh, illustrate or present papers about the rituals of celebration. I see the Asekia as a ritual of celebration. We don't have ministers. We don't have in my religious tradition priests there. We are all all the priests. We are all because it's for all of us the water there. And we need the water. So the water is like a the sustenance through which God is giving us an opportunity to gather and to realize this is good. And the common good, the water, is what will give us what we need so as much as we keep the water and distribute the water 
in equal parts and sometimes sacrificing ourselves for the welfare of others, I see a lot of theology of creation. I see a lot of the moral theology there. I, I think it's that. Thank you, Nelson. I believe Israel had a question or a comment. Yeah, uh, thank you, Christine. I actually have comments and questions for both of you. So I'm going to provide them to each of you so that gives you time to think through and, and sort of help frame that conversation. Um, Paul, I really appreciate the value of experience, right? Uh, you know, as uh, coming from the Catholic tradition, there's been an emphasis by Pope Francis of Encuentro and Encounter. And so I am thinking of two things as I heard you. Is there a way in which conceiving practical theology, contextual theology as a model for beginning to engage this, right? Because you are beginning to engage and in the practice of the, con uh, uh, the parishioners reflecting on the reality, right? If, if, if theology is always top down, then why do I need to worry about my reality? But if we begin to engage in a practice of contextual practical theology, this becomes part of what we do. And so in what way, and, and a further study can help see what that reality is in the world of experience. The other to that is, are there REs ready for these kind of conversations? Are they ready to be able to take a game and take it the way that you were taking it, right? Uh, for Nelson, I, I really appreciate the idea of this cosmology theology, right? I think it's essential. And I think you do well in, in talking about uh, the way that these values are present in, in the community of Asekia. Um, I would say two things. One, I wonder if there could be a space for a theology of stewardship right in the context of uh particular creation right in the uh there's a that's number one and two you know evangelization is about sort of prophetic dialogue which stephen bevins talks about where is the gospel already so in which way is the asekia communities a demonstrating a way that the gospel is already there even though may not be articulating it in those ways and two, be a model, right? A contribution of Latinx communities to the rest of the church and the rest of the world that these models are possible. And sort of be, become sort of a, a, uh, a challenge to other models that says, no, it's not. And so those are my two uh, sort of comments or thoughts. You want to go first, Paul? Yeah, I don't mind going first. Um, all right, so um, so I'll try addressing your questions in in order. I uh, if if I if I misunderstand, please clarify. I can I sometimes uh, misunderstand what uh, what people are are asking me uh, of in this in situations. Um, so the first comment had to do with practical theology. Um, so I'm not. I'm not a great expert on practical theology. I won't. I won't. I won't try and say that I am. Um, but I did have a conversation recently with a uh, practical theologian, uh, in which um, in which he introduced me to uh, the practical theology cycle, and it, it's it's interesting because the practical theology cycle looks almost exactly like Kolb's uh, model of experiential learning. Um, mm -hmm. in the, it starts with concrete experience, moves to reflection and an abstract observation, and then it moves to, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm trying to remember what it is in practical theology, but something very similar to experimentation. And I, I, I looked at it, I thought to myself, well, someone had to have copied someone, <laughs> uh, because it, uh, it really, it really uh, they, 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 uh, they, they look so much alike that, uh, that, 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 that I can't see it as a coincidence. Um, Especially because they're both called cycle, um, and um, and so I think that that practical theology is already there in terms of experience. I think that that the idea that um, the idea that that uh, people form uh, uh, theological beliefs 
uh, based on experience is already uh, is already a notion in practical theology. And so I don't think that my paper uh, adds anything new in that regard. Um, what um, what uh, but your second question, and that is, are we ready for these kind of conversations? And the truth is, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I, 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 I think that the time is right for trying. Um, I, uh, in, in, in my church context, which is not the same as everyone's church context, um, already uh, when I try and sign up for a, uh, for a small group at my local church, what they do is they just put on a video and they have they, they watch a video uh usually from usually it's a, a christian video and they they uh then they hold a discussion afterwards on what was raised in the video and um i think that that from a tech from a technology perspective what i'm proposing is not really all that different from from that um yeah. and i think that i think that um, a lot of young people i know and i mean i, I certainly can't speak for everyone i, I don't think i don't think anyone uh, has has really conducted any quantitative research on it, although maybe I'm wrong. And that, and that is, I, I have no idea how many young people uh, would be favorable to um, to playing digital games and then talking about them from a theological perspective. Um, what I can say is that I know uh, people in the church who I think would be ready for that. Um, but but, uh, but what I, I, I mean, I know people who, uh, I know, for example, that it used to be in um, in evangelical culture. It used to be uh, anathema to play Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but I, I know a lot of evangelicals today who play Dungeons and Dragons, and you know they don't see anything wrong with anything wrong with it. And I think that um, I think that there is a generational change in that regard. And I. I, I mean, I don't have any data to back that up, but it, it's what my gut feeling says. Um, and so are we ready for these kind of conversations? I don't think we'll know unless we try. And I don't know, I, I come from, I, my alma mater is the University of Waterloo. Um, and uh, during the 50th anniversary of the, of the University of Waterloo, they came up with a new slogan for the university and it's called the spirit of why not? And I, I'd like to take that approach, you know, why not? You know, what's the worst that can happen? You know, maybe a few people get upset, you know, we'll learn something in the process. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, let, let me say something about um, your questions to, um, to Paul. I, I, will, I will start with this. So when I was growing up, I remember myself and my brother and my sister, we watched the Jetsons. And the Jetson was a cartoon. And they got, well, like, this is a fantastic reality that will never happen, you know, like never in my life. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know the, the example is the best, but technology provides us with, a, with that reality. Some people will say, ah, it's a meta reality. Some people say, ah, no, it's a, fictitious reality but i don't know that i don't know how 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 close media or in this case the games that uh paul provide us with are far from reality i think they are very close and a good way for evangelization will be through games and i i try to use games in my classes now like too complicated like the the, the paul choice they are too complicated i will take a look on that and i will probably use it but but the students respond well to the games and they, and we talk about and we talk about values and i and i infuse the theology there too and they grasp the concept and they say, well, but, but, but this is a game no it's not a game so if you see the thing like a game Okay, but you are missing the point. The game has something interesting there that we need to catch in order for the discussion that we are doing make sense. The example of the fox, uh, like, like no, the, the girl was feeding the fox, but the but the but the fox was like a what what kind of understanding was that there? It's about mutuality. 
they need each other. The fox need the human, the human need the fox. So of course we support, we, we, we should be ready for that to understand that situation, okay? If we are not ready, when are we ready? <laughs> so we, we are dying. In, in my in my case in Florida, that, that we, we will be on, we will be underwater in what fifty years probably, and so if we don't realize that, so who will make us realize that? So I think I think we are ready, and I think um, this context uh, the the when Israel asks about the contextual theology and the practical theology, this is reality. This is what we need to take into account. Otherwise, we preach. And we say the dogmas and we say the doctrines and it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It, it, it doesn't convert what for me will convert and make students think in theological terms uh, is the games and the stories and, and the stories that, 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 that through which we motivate them to understand, to realize, hey, this is, makes sense. And 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 I uh, we we tell I tell stories about myself to my students how an immigrant who was a dishwasher two blocks from, uh, two blocks from the school now is Doctor Araki but but nobody called me Doctor Araki before now they call me Doctor Araki but how they call me so I told the story I said but the, what is the story that is about sacrifice it's about it's about persistence it's about all of these things that we supposed to have you you supposed to have it too. And they cry, and in my morality class, they 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 got those concepts, but through the stories, through the games. Okay, uh, so my 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 questions, uh, my responses. Um, I think I think um, uh, the asekia is a model of a stewardship, absolutely, a stewardship as as to recognize and to realize uh, the importance of the natural resources as um, uh, in, a, in a community, in an interdependence. Laudato Si, we are connected. We are connected with every single part of the creation. As, as we realize that, we are better stewardships. Better, sorry, better stewards of God's creation. Better stewards of the natural resources. So yes, indeed, the Asekia is a model, an example, a ritual uh, that highlights uh, stewardship. Now, the other thing is about um, like what is the gospel there? I know the theological cosmology and what is the gospel there and all of these things. Like uh, the theological cosmology provide me with a framework. Okay, it's a framework. Okay, that that was created by uh, the framework was created pro, in the Latinx understanding by Garcia Rivera. And and uh, he was like um, in between two fields. Let's put it in that way: science and theology. He actually was a sci a sci scientist. He was working at some point at the very beginning of his, uh, not very beginning, but you know later on, like uh, before theology, he was uh, working by Boeing. He was in a really big project. Okay, and he realized that what good I am doing with this. So he went to theology and he got a doctorate in theology and all of these things. And he, oh, yeah, it makes sense. So he was in between two things, science and theology. Now, when he talked about cos uh, theological cosmology, so is science and theology there. And he went to Thierry de Chardin, who, who better to make a, a a transition uh, no a, trans a, a a communication between science and theology nobody else and 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 so that is the framework that he provided me then in the research I'm doing I realize I recognize I know about this practice called asekia so, but what is asekia so and I understand what is asekia and I read read about the asekia and I did a focus group with people, with parciantes and with, with majordomos. And so what is that for you? And, and they say, they are not religious first. They are, it, it was no theology there. It's me who put the theology, see through the theological cosmology, the, 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 the benefit of the asekia. 
this is this is my my contribution there. So the Aseke is a, if you want to call that like a civil institution. Okay, uh, because of the Latinx, we do it, for example, the first part of the acequia is to do the cleaning, the cleaning of the ditches. And that is due in the feast of San Isidro Labrador. Um, how do you say that in English? Isidore, the Isidore the farmer or something. And in and that is when it starts the process. And it, and also we have our Lady of Guadalupe because, because of the of the roots of the Mexicans there. And the and the whole understanding of popular religiosity there, yeah. But it's not a religious institution; it's more a civil institution. And where I see, I, I see that from the lenses or the framework of the uh, theoretical cosmology, and I see a whole community looking at the good of everything. So is the 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 water per se is a good is a natural is good for us and we need it. So let's make the water like a, for everybody. And this is where the dishes and the acequia and the organization the acequia per se is 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 understood. Thank you, Nelson. Yes. Thank you, Paul. Um, there are some other questions now flowing into the chat. Uh, we have about eight minutes left. I'm just going to read aloud what's in the chat. And then Cheryl has a question she'd like to ask on camera. Um, and I think that'll probably round this out really nicely. So some comments in the chat have been, uh, Elizabeth has a comment that says, uh, Paulos Eco Cristianto has uh, attended a session, has given a paper called, in the session called Common Values and Sustainability, and suggests that that's something that is looked at as well for some synergy between your work. Norma Everest has commented that it may be worthwhile to reflect on how games we play now affect us, even games like Monopoly. And I immediately also thought about like the game of life, oh, that capitalistic game of getting ahead in life. Um, and then Elizabeth also adds here a question for Paul. Uh, Paul, why do you restrict the gaming suggestion to post-secondary youth? I think secondary aged youth really enjoy playing games and to use them in an educational setting stretches them to think more deeply about their recreational games. It's the same as theologically reflecting on the videos of films that we use in past eras. So some comments there. And then Cheryl has a question that she would like to ask and you can respond as you will in the remaining time. Cheryl, go ahead. Thank you, Christine. And there are just two quick comments, so I won't uh, belabor uh, any other points. But Paul, thank you so much for this creative um, exercise. And sort of like what Elizabeth is suggesting, I encourage you to expand your uh, thought of who the church is. Um, and consider opening up this project to other people in Canada, um, in the world around us, who are interested in this. The church is big, bigger than what you and I know it to be. And post-secondary, high school, college, university, I see you doing a course uh, or two or three or seven, um, on this, and as Nelson talked about, um, engaging with students who are motivated to learn about this, motivated to change the world as you did in Waterloo, and Canadians applying for grants and getting government funding to use this tool of practical theology as a theologian um, for the public. So I'll end with that. Thank you very much. Um, and Nelson, your paper was wonderful. Thank you. As I read it, I thought of the, the, the beauty of community honoring and respecting stewarding resources. And we Canadians hate paying taxes. Um, and I've ch changed my perspective towards thinking, why am I paying a tax for water? Why am I paying a tax for garden, well, for garbage? Well, as I read your paper, I thought of our sanitary engineers, the people who collect 
our recycling, our garbage, take it to the dump. They are doing what the people you talked about in community do, worshiping God as they care for the earth and the resources together. So thank you for reminding us that all of the different jobs in our civil service are really intended to care for creation. And we should speak about them that way. And we should not be upset about paying taxes to care for the earth that God has given us to enjoy. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you both. Nelson or Paul, would you like to respond to any of the comments that you've heard? Okay, th thank you very much, uh, Cheryl, for your for your comment. Um, I I think I think it's uh, when you were talking, I was I was um, thinking about how much we take for granted, and and we we don't get it. We we still don't get it. We again, laudato si, Pope Francis. We are interconnected, but are we sure we understand that we are interconnected? So my garbage is something useful for other person. So I just put it in the garbage, but other person will will take it. How, mu how much we, we know about it? How much we know about it? Um is United States is is in United States is like a like a a society that can buy anything. Anything. You can buy anything. I don't I don't think about I, we don't have the idea of Preparation, like a oh, let's fix something. Uh, no, let's buy something new because it's it's cheaper. But, okay, that is one point. The other thing is paying taxes. So we need so uh, we need to pay taxes because we haven't realized the importance of that. I think is that we need to pay taxes because we haven't realized the importance of that. Our garbage is 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 a problem. So why we don't consume less? And put on the garbage in the garbage less too. Is it like 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 that idea of like a, it's consuming and consuming and consuming? I think I think we we can do better. We can we can do better. There is um in one of my presentation I use like a you know you know the card used to say a cogito ergo sum is Latin. Uh, think then I exist. And they, so there is there is a there is a cartoon or something in one of my presentations, consume then I exist. So we we don't need to consume everything. We don't need to buy everything, and that is my fight with my students. Do you really need it? Yes, of course, of course I really need it, Doctor Ake. Come on, <laughs> no, you don't need. It. <laughs> you want it, so we need to make the distinction between what do you want and what do you need. And of course, I'm suffering that with my daughter because she's 17 years old and I am in the process, you know, there is Israel, no hair, probably. And it's like, like, do you really need it? Yes. And I have 300 reasons. No, she just really want it. That's it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. We only have a, about a minute left, but I don't know if Paul, you wanted to make a comment really quickly as we close. Yep. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. I uh, first of all, I agree with what Nelson said about about uh, the importance of uh, garbage collection and all and whatnot in in the uh, game Endling. Um, garbage is is uh, a really big problem uh, that you come across a lot. Uh, it, it's a very lethal problem to the fox, and I think that um, I think that uh, that uh, we can benefit. From learning how in, how important uh, those kind of resources are uh, in in uh, in in uh, the in our society, um, I just want to quickly address um, uh, Elizabeth's question and uh, Cheryl's comment uh, in the time I have. Um, basically, um, the reason why uh, my paper focuses on even evangelical culture, I I I. I um, it is simply because it's where I come from, um, uh, and and it uh, the thing is I I would speak towards um, other Christian communities, um, but I I don't really know what's going on on the ground in them, and I don't want to. But I, I'm open definitely to the model being used in other Christian communities. I just don't want to. I don't want to generalize. I don't want. To, 
to, I don't want to assert some kind of transferability that I can't assert. Um, as for Elizabeth, um, about uh, post-secondary youth, I, I think that about um, uh, secondary aged youth, I think that that's a great suggestion. Uh, my training is in uh, adult learning. Um, and so I don't actually, I, I, I don't know, I'm not well enough acquainted with, um, with um, high school uh, development to be able to really comment on that. Um, what I can say is that from what I can tell, adult learning models are not that different from, from adolescent learning models. And so I don't see why it couldn't work, just that I am not an expert enough to, to really be confident in saying what I said in my paper on that demographic. Thank you both. Thank you everyone for your participation and the active listening that you um, shared with us today. Thank you, Nelson and Paul, for your work and for your collegiality in this session. Be well, everyone.